Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back on our show. This is Liberty Hub, a place where we try to bring different minds from across the globe. Today, we have the privilege to speak to a wonderful Orthodox theologian and patristic professor, professor of patristics rather, at St. Vladimir Theological Seminary in Crestwood, New York. That's Father John Baer. How are you, Father? I'm well. It's good to be with you. Good to catch up with you again. Well, it's incredible that we <coughs> met for the first time in 2002, and now we are like nearly 20 years down the road. Time flies. You were attending, I think, a, a, an Oxford conference, a patristic conference in Oxford. I was yes. a student of Andrew Louth. Uh, and, uh, and then I had the privilege to translate for the Romanian audience your book on the way to Nicaea, the first volume. Mm -hmm. Thank and you very much for that. A growing number of, of books and essays and publications coming from under your pen. Yes. And, then, and then finally, uh, we are sort of very glad to see that you've produced a new book. Can, can you show us the book about... Uh, John the Evangelist. Yes, it's called, here it is, it's called John the Theologian and his Paschal Gospel, a Prologue to Theology. Just came out with Oxford a couple of months ago. It will be fascinating to, to talk about his gospel and his uh, revelation, so to speak, mm -hmm. his book of revelation. But be, let's begin first by asking some very basic questions, because what strikes me, fa Father, is that uh, these days that we are now seeing, witnessing a retrieval of the oral tradition in a, in a very broad sense. So people don't read books anymore. I'm sorry <laughs> to say that, but they seem, to be, they seem to be drawn into this new culture of podcasts and conversations all right. over the place. And you are part of this global conversation and we are very, very thrilled to see you everywhere. But let me ask you uh, from this perspective, uh, since we've, we are now living almost like a, a, like a sort of 500 years of logocentric tradition in which the text, the word, was central to our mental intellectual discipline. And we are entering a new phase almost, a videocratic age in which images, words, and sounds seem to yeah. be more prevalent. How do you see this tension between the text on the one hand, the biblical text, and the tradition, the living tradition on the other hand? I don't think it's a tension. I think it's actually fundamental to the tradition from the beginning. Um, the thing which comes to my mind is St. Irenaeus and his image of the mosaic. Scripture, he says, is a mosaic which depicts Christ. If you, if you read it with the right hypothesis, the right canon, you can see all the different parts of Scripture as together forming a mosaic. Yeah? So he's just using a visual image there. But when you bring liturgy into it, which is basically a mosaic putting together scripture in visual, oral, audio, uh, ritual type practices, it, it together forms a whole. And, and of course you have to, to see the king and not the fox at the end. Yes, yeah. Um, and there's one thing which is so fundamental in all of this, which in a sense is kind of really obvious, but we'd never really take for, we never really systematically reflect upon and what it really means for how we read and um, engage with scripture, I would always want to begin with um, the road to Emmaus. Exactly. It's the most fascinating thing. You know, the disciples are with Christ for all those years. They saw him doing all of those miracles. They met his mother. They, they heard what she had to say. They heard his teaching, all of these kind of things. They witnessed him being crucified. They denied him. They saw the empty tomb. They didn't understand. They meet the risen Lord on the road to Emmaus, and they still don't understand. Yeah, that's and Luke then, and Cleopas, right? Luke and Cleopas in Luke 24. In John, it's different, but in the synoptics, in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, this point is made really, really fundamental. They meet the risen Lord on the road to Emmaus, and they don't understand who he is. In fact, they ask him, who are you? Are you a stranger? Haven't you heard what's been going on? You know, we were following this Jesus, and he went and got himself killed, and the tomb is empty, and we don't know what's happening. Yeah? Then having told him that, he then does two things. He opens the scriptures, meaning Moses, the Psalms, the prophets, what we now call the Old Testament, which is a term I would rather not use. It's simply the scripture. He opens the scripture to show how they all spoke about him and how he had to suffer to enter into his glory. Their hearts start to burn, and then they recognize him in the breaking of bread. And in the breaking of the bread, when they recognize him, their eyes are open, he disappears from sight. Okay? So the two points I'd want to get from that is that our encounter with the risen Lord is always done 
through the opening of the scripture and the breaking of the bread. It wasn't enough to be on that road to Emmaus back then because they didn't get it. It was the opening of the scripture and the breaking of the bread. Those are the two fundamental determinants for encountering the risen Lord. Yeah? They didn't know him before that. It's only as a crucified and risen one that they know him, and they know him through the opening of scripture and the breaking of the bread. And that's and the, the liturgy, right? That's the, the uh, gist that, of the liturgy. That, that's why it's so important just to really hone in on that point, because that is what we do when we're in church. We open the scripture in the readings, in the homilies, in the hymnography. The hymnography is basically, you know, all these images, texts from scripture being woven together, a passage from here, a passage from Isaiah, a passage from South, being woven together into this matrix, together with the iconography, together with the ritual, together with all these different things. So when we go to church, we shouldn't think about it as entering into a stone building. We should think about it as being the road to Emmaus. It is a matrix, and the word matrix, I know whenever I say the word matrix, people think about the Hollywood films, <laughs> but the word matrix simply means womb. It's the womb in which we put on the identity of Christ. The church is our mother, and its matrix is formed by all this intertextuality from the scripture in all this visual, oral, liturgical, musical, homiletic, reading, all these different ways, so that um, we can encounter the risen Lord, who's then known in the breaking of the bread, the culmination of all liturgy is the Eucharist. And in the Eucharist, when we consume the Eucharist, when we partake of the Eucharist, we become his body. Yeah, we, don't, we, don't, we don't celebrate the Eucharist simply to enact changes in the bread and the wine into the body and blood. It's body and blood so that we can eat it, so that we can become his body, which is why he disappears from sight, because we're his body. It's really as simple as that. If I could see him somewhere else, I wouldn't be his body. No, we are his body. Yeah? So, so, so that, well, 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 one further thing. So the historical distance between then and now, that that happened 2,000 years ago and we're now 2,000 years later, that historical distance isn't a hindrance. It's not an obstacle. Those who were there then didn't get it. They only got it by the opening of scriptures and breaking the bread. And that's what we still do. So if you want to meet Christ, you just have to, to go to the liturgy. <laughs> you have to go to the liturgy with your ears open and your eyes open and listening to what's going on um, and partaking in all that's going on to be formed into all of this. And the church is, is, is the womb, as you said, where the, the word, the seed is being planted and the yeah. seed sort of takes root into your heart. Uh, right. The more open you are to, to listening and to obeying the word. But li right. listen. Uh, Father, Father John, before we go into these beautiful and very sophisticated images of the patristic exegesis, the, pa yeah. the tapestry, uh, the mosaic, and so on, uh, I would ask you still a, a, a very broad question here. So you've got like three, it seems to me, three major approaches to the question of, you know, how can I know God? You've got the natural theology approach through reason. You have this Thomistic approach. Lots of apologists. Why am I mentioning this? Because I see now people trying to defend you know, faith in God these days by using classical yeah. arguments like cosmological arguments. Yeah. It never works. <laughs> All right. So you've got this uh, attempt to defend the existence of God from nature through reason. Then you've got m more of a Protestant approach. Read the Bible. If you don't uh, sort of, if you don't get it, then you are an unbeliever. Um, and, and of course, we'll, 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 we'll cast you out. From our, uh, from our midst. And then thir the third approach seems to me is, is the one which emphasizes ex personal experience. So you go to right. Mount Athos, you talk to a monk, he will tell you, don't read the Bible necessarily because you might be sort of deluded. Uh, don't do scholastic theology because that's from the devil, but go to church, experience the Eucharist, and then you will be enlightened. Are these three tendencies uh, separate or can we actually reconcile them? Um, I think you can reconcile them, but I think that they're also, put like that, they're also, each and every one of them, problematic. Let's okay. go through. Let, let's, let's go through, go through them. So, the, the, natu the natural theology approach. Well, it's never persuaded anybody. As simple as that. It's never worked. There's a very real sense in which all of those natural theology type arguments are only meant to give I don't know, further insight to those who already believe. All right. Okay. The second one, with regard to... Um, reading scripture all you need to know is read scripture and that's sufficient and so on that's the only way to do it 
going back to the thing we talk about with the road to Emmaus, it is really important that the fundamental question is, how are you reading scripture? Yeah. So when the apostle, when, when Christ opens the book to them, it is not as if they hadn't read scripture before. Another example of that would be the apostle Paul. Before he encountered the Lord, he knew scripture. He was reading it backwards and forwards. He was a trained rabbinic scribe under Gamaliel. You know, he knew scripture better than we're ever going to know it. But his reading of scripture, meaning the Old Testament, didn't lead him to Christ. It led him to persecute the church. The scripture was a veil for him. And so he's, and then he encounters Christ on the road to Damascus. He's blinded. Um, his eyes are subsequently open. And now he reads scripture differently. Yeah, and that's, that's a point. He reads it now differently to the way he was reading it before. Okay? And the whole question is, what is that difference? The text hasn't changed. His starting point has changed. He's no longer reading scripture for what he was before his encounter with Christ. He's reading scripture in the light of Christ and now reading it differently. And so he will use the analogy of before the encounter with Christ, scripture was veiled. The veil that Moses had over his head when he came down from the mountain that same veil lies over scripture when you're reading it without Christ. Okay? So it has to be unveiled. So there, there are all sorts of different ways of reading scripture. The most predominant one in the last couple of centuries is reading it merely historically. You know, you're reading as this is what happened, this is what happened, this is what happened, and so on. You know, from Genesis onwards, uh, Exodus, the uh, exile, the return, all these kind of things. Um, now, undoubtedly, scripture was written in different historical circumstances, was edited in different ways, came to be collected as books in whatever different way that happened. And it's really important to know all of that, if for no other reason than just to read the words on the page. You've got to have access to all the historical disciplines to know what range of meanings a particular word might have in the time. Yeah? However, you're still reading it as a veiled way if you're reading it like that. Irenaeus would say, um, and against heresies, is if you're reading it like that, you're reading it as no more than myth. Even if it's historically true, you're reading it about the wandering of people through the desert and this, that, and the other. Okay? Only, he says, only when you turn to Christ is scripture unveiled in the light of the cross and Christ is then revealed. Let's go so, on. I, go so, on. I, so I would actually say, and I, you, know, you probably gather that I like to be provocative, unless you're reading scripture allegorically, you're not reading it as scripture. But you're it's a text. It as a text, as a historical book, as a book of history, or that you're not reading it as scripture. To read it as scripture for a Christian means to read it unveiled in the light of Christ. So Christianity is not the religion of the book, but the religion of the word or the the, the religion of Christ. We're Christians, you know, we're, we're we're people who put on the identity of Christ, or at least are trying to do so, and encounter him through the opening of the book. Yeah. Um so, but, let's so begin, but let's begin now with the first book, because uh, the book... Well, no, actually, let, let, let's, go, let's go to the third point. You know, right. there's people who say that all you've got to do is go to church and be oh, mystical. Actually, yeah. yeah. Well, my, my point would be that, um, what, as, as we said earlier, what we are given in church is, in fact, this opening of Scripture. Yeah, in, in, the, in the matrix that, that we spoke about earlier. So unless you're reading Scripture that way, all you're hearing is words. Yeah, so you can't separate being in church from reading scripture. And I think any father would be absolutely horrified at that, the idea that you could, you know, not read scripture and simply come to church. So probably you are also a father confessor and probably some of your disciples come up to you. Do you encourage them to, to study the, the Bible, to read absolutely. the Bible? Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's simply inconceivable that you could be a Christian and not read scripture. You do, you do so as someone who comes to church and hears the way that the church is presenting the scriptures to you, you know, in the hymnography, in the ritual, in the iconography, in, the lit in everything we said. But that also then feeds your way of reading scripture as your daily practice. Maybe, I just, maybe it was more of a polemical response in some of the uh, European lands uh, when we saw Protestant, Protestant, absolutely, yeah, making the Bible a weapon against yeah. ritual. Then perhaps yeah. we thought we should not yeah. see the Bible as as the way 
uh, towards God, but rather as a as a danger, as a right. So, so we took we took a side in that polemic without questioning the polemic itself or the frame. Yeah, the frame yeah. of the polemic. Now, yeah. I would like to I should like to to, to begin by asking you. Uh, something about the first book of the Bible, the book of Genesis, because you mentioned the word, critical word, myth. And in the fathers, you have this uh, clear distinction between history and myth or mythology on the one hand in their rejection of Gnosticism. But yeah. on the other hand, there's, there's, a, there's a sense in which they are actually telling us a story, a foundational story about God's plan and God's actions and, 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 and well, God's... Yeah. Yeah. So, Absolutely. so in, in a way, they are producing something that is close to a myth, but a myth which is true. Yeah, a myth is true. But when you read it in the light of Christ, yeah, and you're to read it in the light of Christ, and that's what the church simply does throughout the liturgy. So with regard to the opening chapters of Genesis, um, we spoke earlier about the Gospel of Matthew, Mark, and Luke. We didn't turn to the Gospel of John yet, yeah? Yeah. The Gospel of John plays off Genesis in the beginning, in the beginning. John tells you from the outset what he's doing is presented vis-a-vis -vis Genesis. Yeah? And I, in my book on the Gospel of John, which had just come out, I argue that um, when Christ says on the cross, in the Gospel of John, and only in the Gospel of John he says this, it is finished, to tell his day, it doesn't mean Oh, my work has now come to an end, I'm going to return to the Father. The word tetelestem means it's completed, it's brought to perfection. So the beginning in the... So in the, the, the question then is, what is brought to perfection? So if John tells us to go back and look at Genesis, in the beginning, in the beginning, when we go back and look at Genesis, something really interesting opens up. And you can see this reflection in the early centuries. What opens up is that, when you look at the first chapter of Genesis, God speaks everything into existence. He says, let it be, let it be, let it be. Let there be light, let word, it be. Yeah. Okay, so he creates everything by a word, by a commandment, in the imperative, let it be. And then he does something completely different. He says, let us make a human being. Yeah, he doesn't say, let there be a human being. We always focus on the plural, you know, let us, therefore the Trinity, and so on. But the more interesting thing is the fact that it's in a subjunctive, not an imperative. It's let us make. It's a project. Okay? It's a project which um, is the only thing said to be God's own work. Everything else is said, let it be, let it be. Everything else is like the scenery on the stage. God sets a scenery, and then he starts his own project. And his project is to make a human being in his own image and likeness. Okay? And I would say that that's what's finished when Christ is on the cross and says, Tetelestai, it's complete, it's brought to perfection. It's and interesting. Got, yeah, and then you've got the garden. Where wait, 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 wait. Let's, let's, go through, let's unpack it all, because it's, it's so fascinating. You've then got, um, uh, you've got Pilate saying, so you've got Pilate saying, Idhu or Anthropos, only in the Gospel of John. You behold the human being. So you've got script, yeah, Eke Homer. So you've got scripture starting off by God saying, let it be, let it be, let it be. Everything's set in place, like the scenery on the stage, for God to now work. And God's work is to make a human being. It's his project, which finishes on the cross in the Gospel of John, where Pilate says, behold the human being. Yeah? So the divine project is the human project. It's the project of making a human being. And this Christ first shows us the truth about what it is to be human. Yeah, and the church does this. So on Holy Saturday, as we bury the body of Christ in the tomb, we say, we sing at the high point of both the um, matins and vespers, we say, this is the blessed Sabbath on which God rests from all his work. Yeah, we don't say... Here's the reason to do so, yeah. Yeah, we don't, but we say, this is the blessed Sabbath. We don't say... This is like the Sabbath, when God, rest, God completed everything at the beginning, and he finished it, and he rested, and now Christ is also resting. We identify it. Moses speaks of Christ. When, Christ when, when Moses speaks about God resting, this is Christ in the tomb. Yeah? So liturgically, that's what we do. Um, here is a human being. The work of God is complete, and now Christ rests in the tomb. Okay? Um, you've also got other things in John, um, to take up Genesis 2. In Genesis 2, 
God makes a human being from, from the earth, breathes a breath of life into his nostrils, so he becomes a, a, a living human being. And then he says, um, he says, it's not good for man to be alone. Yeah? And then what does he do? He, he's, uh, he's giving life to Eve. No, what he then does is to bring all the animals before Adam. Exactly. <laughs> yeah? Before he makes a, He says, it's not good for man to be alone. Let us make a, a helper fit for him. And what does he do? He brings all the animals to Adam. Why? To is give he, them names. Yeah, but, what, but, but his purpose was, he says, it's not good for man to be alone. Let us make a helper fit for him. And then he brings up all the animals to see what Adam would call them. Yeah? Why does God do that? If God wants to make a helper fit for him, why does he bring all the animals to Adam? Is, is he working by trial and error? Here, try a giraffe. No, that doesn't work. Here, try an elephant. No, it doesn't work. No, God's not working by trial and error. The conclusion of all of that is that for Adam, there was not found a helper fit for him. Yeah? And it's ambiguous in, the, in the, both the Hebrew and the Greek. There was not found a helper fit for him. Who found there was no helper fit for him? Well, God's not working by trial and error. So almost certainly it is Adam found that there was no helper fit for him. Which is why later on he says, this at last is bone of my bones. Okay, So God brings all the animals before him. This is Genesis 2.20. Genesis 2.20. God brings all the animals before him to awaken in Adam a desire for one like himself. Because earlier it was God who said it's not good for man to be alone. Man did not know that. So having seen all the other animals, given them names, man then says, well, where's mine? Yeah. Then God puts him to sleep. From his side takes out the rib, the, um, builds the rib up into a woman and leaves the woman to the man and the two should become one flesh. Yeah? Right. So what does John do that? Do it's, it's, it? it's, well, well, one more thing. It says the, the, the two should become one flesh. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and his mother, and the two shall become one flesh. Now, that's a really, really odd verse. Why does God say, for this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother? Okay, on the one hand, it's a story of origin. So there is no father or mother. Okay. But that's the nature of a story of origins. Okay, it's got to start somewhere. But more intriguingly is the fact that, he le that the man leaves father and mother. Yeah? Where has it ever happened? Almost invariably, it's the woman who leaves her father and mother to join herself to the man. Exactly. Yeah? So it's not a description of a historical practice. It's not um, an injunction to do this in this way because nobody ever tried to do that. Yeah? So it's not descriptive, it's not prescriptive. So what's it speaking about? So who is the man who left his father's side to join himself to his spouse? I think you have to read it Christologically. Christ is the one who left his father's side to join himself to his spouse. Okay. So now, if you've got to read it Christologically, we can now turn back to the Gospel of John and... Um, we see that John's again playing on this theme at the crucifixion. Out, uh, the, the Christ's side was pierced with a spear. Out of his side came blood and water, which everybody from the beginning takes to symbolize the church, baptism and Eucharist. Okay? So out of Adam's side came a rib built up into a woman, and she was called the mother of life. Yeah? But in fact, all her children turn out to be ones who die. Yeah? She gives birth to mortals. Yeah, to those who will die. Out of Christ's side comes the virgin mother, the church, who gives birth to living children to the extent they die with Christ in baptism. And this is us, the Christians. That's us. That's us, the Christians. Okay. And then you can take it one step further. John plays again on, the, on Genesis 2. When, when Eve is brought by God to Adam... Who would she have thought Adam to be? Well, you tell us. <laughs> okay. The only way that Adam has been identified so far is his clay taken from the earth, breathed a breath of life into his nostrils, and then God set him in the garden to work it. 
Yeah. Right. He's a gardener. He's a gardener. Yeah. So, so Eve, when she's brought to Adam, would have thought, who are you? Are you the gardener? Okay. Which is again what John is doing in the resurrection scene. Exactly. Now it rings the bell. Yeah. So, so in all of this, John is showing us how to read Genesis. Genesis is a prefiguration, the fulfillment of which is Christ. So John the Evangelist is one of the best readers of the book of Genesis. Absolutely. But, but Paul also does that. Um, and then the two come together and people like Irenaeus. So when Paul talks in Corinthians 15 about the first man, Adam, is from the earth and is animated by a breath of life. The last Adam is a life-giving spirit. Yeah? So it's a movement from type to reality. Adam's a type. Adam's a sketch. Adam's a prefigurement. The, the true reality is Christ himself. Adam is animated by a breath of life. Christ is the life-giving spirit, or gives us the life-giving spirit. It's a movement from breath to life, to spirit, to the Holy Spirit. Yeah? Now, the thing about a, a breath of life, a breath is inherently mortal. You know, a breath, oh, it expires. It okay? does. Yeah. That's just what, what it does. It expires. Um, now, if you think about it, we've all come into the world with no choice about it. Nobody asked me if I wanted to exist. That's Kirillov in, in Dostoevsky's of Possess. Nobody asked me if I wanted to. We think we've got freedom. You know, because we can vote for this party or that party. We can have a cup of coffee or a cup of tea. We think we've got freedom. But no, we're not. We're here. We've been thrown into a world. And we've been thrown into an existence in which whatever we do, we will die. Our breath will expire. And then what we've done from the beginning, from Adam and from our, our own first breath, is we try and preserve our breath. Yeah. We through do all science, kinds of through technology we're trying to prolong our lives biological lives we're trying to preserve our breath but christ is very emphatic if you try and preserve your life what will happen you'll lose it you'll lose it you might, you might gain an extra day or two and you'll be bound up in all sorts of egoism and passion and sinfulness by trying to extend your life to preserve it you know um we're so fond of saying that christ has conquered death yeah is it that simple? You know, how many people listening to this video are not going to die? No, it's not, it's not as simple as that. The New Testament language really is that Christ has conquered the fear of death, which has held us captive from the beginning. It's a fear of death which has held us captive. So Christ says, if you try and preserve your life, acting out of a fear of life and all the other things, you're going to lose it. But he says, if you lose it for my sake, for your neighbor, for the kingdom, for, for Christ, for all the ways you can spell it out. If you lose it for my sake, you'll gain it. Why? Because if we use our mortal breath of life in a way which is not trying to preserve it, but to live for others, following Christ by taking up the cross and so on, then the mode of life we begin to live even now cannot be touched by death because we've entered into it through death. This is something that Martin Heidegger was not quite aware of. <laughs> no, Michel Henri perhaps, but not Martin Heidegger, yeah? So if we, if we lose our life, we gain it, yeah? And we gain a life which cannot be touched by death because we've entered into it through death, okay? So Adam is a sketch animated by a breath of life. What we're called to do is to change our existence, which from the beginning, our existence is necessity and mortality, Nobody asked me if I want to exist. Here I am, and I'm going to die. It sucks. Yeah? Necessity and mortality. But in Christ, by Christ, through Christ, we're able to use that mortality to turn itself inside out, trampling down death by death. So to take up the cross, to begin to live a life which is a life of um, the Spirit, a life which cannot be touched by death, we've entered into it through death. No longer living for myself, but for my neighbor. And this is what Christ shows us on the cross. So Christ is the true human being. Yeah? So self-knowledge doesn't exist in the absence of Christ. No. So we, we, we tend to take, you know, we tend to take the creedal reflections that Christ is true God and true man. And we, we, I think we misunderstand that. We take it as, you know, we know what God is and we know what the human being is. And we want to say that Christ is both. Yeah. No, we should take it the other way around. We should say Christ defines for us what it is to be God 
and what it is to be human. He shows us what it is to be God in the way he dies as a human being. That's wonderful. That's beautiful. Isn't that, we, we did this when we talked about the road to Emmaus. We didn't know him to be God by raising the sick, by being transfigured on a mountain, by being whatever else. We didn't know it. It's only through the passion we know who he is, trampling down death by death. So he shows us what it is to be God in the way he dies as a human being, voluntarily laying down his life in an act of love. And he says in the Gospel of John, for this reason the Father loves me because I lay my life down for my sheep. Yeah? But he simultaneously, in one, shows us what it is to be human. Yeah? You know, fully divine, fully human, in one hypothesis, one prosopon. You can only look at the one Christ who defines for us what it is to be God and what it is to be human. So to be human is, in fact, to lay down your life in an act of love for your neighbor. Okay? So, in fact, you've got people like Ignatius on his way to martyrdom. He, he exhorts the Roman Christians, let me go to my martyrdom. Don't interfere with it. Don't try and talk me out of it. He says, birth pangs are upon me. Do not try and stop me from living by keeping me alive. Let me go to my martyrdom. When I shall have arrived there, I will be in the light and I will be a human being. He's not yet born. He's not yet living. He's not yet human. He would only become human by following Christ to his martyrdom. Yeah. Died so, in a uh, hundred and yeah seven. Let, let me just, just add a few more words to that. Um, people often ask me when they tell them that, "Am I not already a human being?" Well, it depends on how you define a human being. If you define a human being as one who's able to walk and talk, pretty minimal. Well, a newborn baby can't do that, and that's not because of any imperfection in the legs or the arms or the or the tongue. It's because you've got to exercise. You've got to exercise, and part of the exercising would be falling down, getting up, falling down, getting up, learning how to walk. Okay, And then you learn to to walk and talk. If you define a human being as, you know, a rational animal, well, once you start to learn to walk and talk, as any parent knows, you then got to start working on the reason part. (laughs) You know, know, behave yourself. Don't do that. Think about it. Yeah, Um, And that takes a long time. If you define a human being as one who lives um, by voluntarily laying down their life for their neighbor, well, that, very, takes, that takes even more growth. That takes a growth in, in a life of, of asceticism and virtue and love and all the rest of it. It takes more growth. Yeah. So only in the Synaxarion you will find the real human beings. Yes. In yes. a sense. This is what we're called to become. So we're given the opportunity. To, we come into existence in necessity and mortality. But in and through Christ, we can turn that mortality into an act of free, voluntary, self-sacrificial love. Yeah? And so we, uh, we, instead of necessity mortality, we then ground our existence in free, voluntary, self-sacrificial love. And then to go back to Genesis, think about it. For everything else, God says, let there be, let there be, let there be. But he doesn't say, let there be a human being. Let us make. Yeah. And now who's he addressing when he says, let us make, who's he addressing? The father speaking to the son. Well, not only that. Yes, but not only that, if to be a human being is to live by freely, voluntarily laying down your life in an act of love for your neighbor. Could you, in fact, say, let there be a human being? Well, yeah. Now, if a human being is one who voluntarily lays down their life for their neighbor, could, could you simply say, let there be a human being? No, would, not, not in that sense. No, no, it not like, be, be, yeah. Because it wouldn't be a, an act of free, voluntary, self-sacrificial love. So you've got to have the choice. So, which means we are the ones who've got to say, let it be. Christ says, let it be in the garden, not my will, but thy will be done. Mary says, let it be to me according to your will. And each and every one of us has got to say, let it be. We are the ones who've got to say, we are the ones who've got to say, let it be to God's own work. So we have to accept that there is this 
potential for growth, spiritual growth, which will enable us to live a life, a Christ-like life. Yes, but we can only do that voluntarily. It's our response. We've got to say, let it be. We've got to say, amen. We've got so to, we have to say, let it be to the let us make. Yeah. All right. So for, so for everything else, God says, let it be. For his own project, we're the ones who got to say, let it be. Like the Beatles. Absolutely. And when the Beatles say, all you need is love. Yes, you're right. But now we know what the love required is. <laughs> Uh, a sense of a sense of obedience and discipline so father what you've told us uh and you've just shown how to apply this hermeneutical greed is that what you've told us that unless you read the old testament you don't like to use the word old testament but well, let, me, let me just let me just stop you there you know if the evangelists and the, and the apostle paul and the nicene creed all use the word scripture why should we that, yeah it seems like a pretty good term. Now, the reason why I'm hesitant with the term Old Testament is because as soon as we call it Old Testament, we think it is simply about the things that happened in the past before Christ. And we read it as, if you like, the prior history to Christ. Yeah? Rather than as Moses spoke of me. Exactly. Or before Abraham, I, I am. Yeah. Or Isaiah saw my glory or any of the things you can say about that. So by calling it Old Testament, you're, you're kind of immediately putting it, you know, especially when we've got the book called the Bible with the Old Testament followed by the New Testament. We think if we want to know about Christ, we've got to go to the New Testament. No, the primary t place we've got to go to is the scriptures. Moses, Isaiah, the Psalms, Ezekiel, all of that material. Yeah? But let me insist on this a bit, Father. So are you telling us that unless you, you have these Christological lenses uh, which help you see in the story of Israel, the story of the church, in Adam, you know, a, a prefiguration of, of, of Christ, and so on and so forth. Uh, there's no knowledge or wisdom you can gain as, a, as an ordinary, say, uh, skeptical New Yorker. Can you not open the Bible and get some, something out of it, like the book of oh, Proverbs? Or... Oh, sure you can. Absolutely you can. Um, Would you not insist that the Bible should be part of the great books tradition? That oh, the Bible... absolutely, absolutely. And, and I also want to kind of nuance what I said earlier, that although Paul talked about the veil being lifted or the disciples on the road to Emmaus, the book was open to them, same kind of image, they knew the text beforehand. Yeah, you know, so you've got to know the text. So that familiarity is being required. Yeah, absolutely it is. Yeah, but now you can see it as in greater depth. So as you're reading it as Old Testament, you've got a narrative about creation. You've got a narrative about Exodus from Egypt across the waters into the desert, moving towards the promised land, always you know, trying to get there, exile and so on. When you read it in the light of Christ, remember the, the scene of the transfiguration. Christ is on the mountain with Moses and Elijah, the law and the prophets, the living and the dead. And he's speaking to them, it says, about the Exodus he will accomplish in Jerusalem. Yeah. So now we can see that the Exodus, After Palm Sunday, yeah? Yeah. So now we can see that the Exodus is not simply a geographical relocation, it's a movement from this world to the Father. Yeah. And likewise, we can now see our own life as an Exodus. So using the imagery that we spoke about earlier, I came into this world in necessity and mortality. I mean, I'm in this world as Egypt. Yeah, this world is Egypt to me. I pass through the waters of baptism, and now this world is like a desert in which I'm traveling, te being tempted, and whatever, all, all the things you can say. To the extent I take up the cross, this world will be the paradise of God with the cross as a tree of life. And the Eucharist will be the manna. Absolutely. So, um, there are three different exoduses one can talk about. They're all ultimately the same, but we've now got three different levels of meaning. You've got the exodus, which was a geographical translocation. You've got Christ's exodus, and you've got our exodus in him. Which is the most important one. Yeah. Because, because it's the only one that gives meaning to our lives. Yeah, it's the only one that's actually speaking about us. But you can only do that if you're reading it in that Christological way. If you're not... It's just talking about a geographical translocation. Exactly. So 
the Eucharist you know, becomes an act of remembrance rather than a participation in the body of Christ. Right. Or to put it, yeah, absolutely. Or to put it another way, you know, I've left Europe and I've come to the promised land. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, you have to debate with the, <laughs> with the hardliners there. So uh, obviously there are, I mean, there are fruits. Uh, should, I, should I say there are fruits w- which one can, uh, w- one can discover in a particular culture where Christianity was more or less alive or where Christianity was being yeah. uh, widely spread? In a sense, I believe in the 19th century when in America there were lots of Bible study houses and uh, lots of Bibles being distributed around this is what Tocqueville notices. He, he comes to America in 1832. He's noticing that lots of people read the Bible, un, uh, unlike in Europe, where right. lots of people were, especially the intellectuals, were reading Voltaire. So yeah. it does make a difference wh- wh- whether you are in a culture permeated by a sense of, you know, Christian uh, faith or if you are just born in, a, in, so- in the Soviet Union. I mean, that, that difference is still there. Yeah. So, Let's not um, do sociology. Let's still do theology. So, so Father, uh, what about the genres, the, mon- the multiple genres of the Bible? Why do we have history? Um, why do we have poetry? Why do we have sapiential texts like the, the book of Proverbs? Why, how can you account for the unity of the Bible when you have so many multiple, so many genres? Excuse me. So all the different genres, all the different books come out of very clearly the history of Israel, its religious tradition, the temple, sapiential literature, wisdom, prophets. I mean, the whole mix of all of that. And I really want to emphasize again, you need to know all of that. Yeah, Knowing the scriptures on the most fundamental level is knowing the words on the page. Unless you know the words on the page, you don't know what you're talking about. Yeah, But it's so they, they, they were all written in these different historical contexts, these different religious contexts and so on. And they're all there at the time of Christ. And then what makes them cohere as scripture, for Christians anyway, is uh, the passion of Christ. Yeah? The passion of Christ, um, somebody once put it as, you know, all of this is like a super saturated solution. You, you drop the crystal into it and the whole thing crystallizes and you can see it clearly. That's a powerful image. Yeah. Yeah, I never but thought of got, it. Yeah. But you've got to know the, the letters on the page. You've got to know the, you've got to know the basic narrative about uh, Adam and Eve, about Noah, about, I don't know, whatever else, uh, Abraham and Isaac. I will because, ask you a, a, a trivial question right now. So have you seen, have you noticed any difference between, say, my generation of students uh, who came to college or university when they were like uh, 18 years old, this was 20 years ago, and a new generation of students who come with perhaps a, a, a more mediocre a knowledge of the Bible. Is there any difference in that respect? Well, you know, I'm, I'm in a particular situation teaching at a seminary. So they all most, know the scriptures? In, very, in varying degrees, but they, they all know they should know the scriptures. Right, <laughs> yeah. right. For my, for my colleagues in teaching in theological departments at universities, they are shocked by the lack of knowledge of uh, the basic narratives. Who's Adam? Who's Noah? Right, right. You know? And that's not just in theology departments. You know, I've got people, uh, friends who teach in philosophy departments and trying to teach Kierkegaard without students knowing Abraham and Isaac. I mean, how do you do it? <laughs> Precisely. So if, you, if, if, I were, if I was to ask you, if I were to ask you, can a philosopher get something from the Bible which has relevance for the philosophical community? Outside the church, what would you say? Maybe we can go back to Michel Henri. You've just mentioned his name. Yeah. So um, there are two things I'd want to say. First of all, one of my favorite lines from the early writers is in Origen, where he says, "In the light of Christ, all things. Be- in the light of the gospel, all things become gospel." Mm-hmm. A really beautiful, powerful statement. In the light of the gospel, you can now read Moses and Isaiah as speaking about Christ. It's become gospel. Yeah? And the light of the gospel proclaimed according to these scriptures, you can look everywhere and see, as Justin would put it, seeds of the word. Yeah? But the logo is the, yeah. yeah. But, but, but the, the, um, the, the hermeneutical dynamic is really important. It's retrospectively. In the light of the gospel, you can see it. So Justin can look at Plato's writings and say, look, 
their, their logi spermatici in Plato's writings. Had you told Plato that, he would have said, what on earth are you talking about? Yeah. So it, it's not a straightforward horizontal discourse. It's a retrospective discourse in the light of the passion. So we can look everywhere and see that. Can I interrupt now, you here? Just, just a yeah. second. Is it, is it similar to a situation in which a lover, someone who falls in love with his girlfriend, sees his entire past as leading yes. towards that yes. particular moment? Yes, absolutely. And you could never have, he, he could never have known that five years earlier. But exactly. in, the light of, in the light of the present, you can see all things leading to the present. Yeah. And Christ is the ultimate um, vantage point by which we can see all things in him. But that's only known at the end. So in fact, you know, with regard to my own identity, you could say my identity is my past told from the light of the present. Yeah. But my knowledge of the present is only partial. It's only through, through a mirror darkly, as Paul would say. Yeah? It is only at the end that I finally understand how all things cohere from the beginning in such a way that they lead to the ultimate bridegroom, to Christ himself. Okay? It's, death is the signature of life. Yeah. Go back to that same theme. Yeah. Um, now, with regard to some, uh, how, how philosophers use the Bible, it is really interesting to see the, the theological turn in French phenomenology not just Michel Henry, but Jean-Luc Marion, Lacoste, Yves Lacoste, and so on, many others, um, Emmanuel Falk, and so on. But I, I really have found Michel Henry to be the most fascinating of all of them. Um, and I'm, I'm, to be honest, I'm not really sure what to do with all of that. So in my book, I try to put his reading, his phenomenological reading of, especially the Gospel of John, into dialogue with you know, Irenaeus and modern scriptural scholars and so on. Um, so it's the phenomenology of divine life that you yeah. uh, looked at, uh, the book yeah. called Incarnation and then the words of Christ? Yeah, so, so I'm, I'm used to working in a more historical key. You know, I'm, I'm a patristic scholar, so I'm, I'm reading Irenaeus and I'm really trying to understand Irenaeus in the second century and so on, and how he's reading John and all those kind of things. And in doing that in a strict historical manner, I'm seeing the kind of things we spoke about earlier, how life comes through death and Genesis and Christ and all those kind of things. Yeah? Michel Henry is deliberately not working in that key. He's explicit. I'm, I'm not going to be working in a historical key and a textual key and all the rest of it. The horizon, he says, the horizon I'm going to work on is not the horizon of the world and its light and its history. That ultimately is a veil, he would say. Exactly. Um, the horizon I'm going to work on is the horizon of life itself, life which doesn't show itself in the world. You know, we can see living beings, but we can't see life. Uh, and for him, it's, it's connected. Life is only known and seen in the experience of life. It doesn't show itself in the world. It's only seen in life. As a psalm would say, in thy light, I see light. You know, not in the light of the sun do I see your light. In, the, in your own light, we see light. And the, the life that Michel Henry talks about is intimately bound up with pathos. Yeah? Again, pathos, suffering. And by suffering, it doesn't just mean pain and anxiety. It also means joy. You know, pathos in a broader sense. Pathos doesn't show itself in the world. What shows itself in the world is divorced from itself. It's true identity and shows itself under the light of the sun. It's separated from itself. Something like life and pathos is only known, encountered, exists experience in the experience of pathos life and so on yeah suffering is only in the experience of suffering it doesn't exist anywhere else and in that experience of suffering in that broad range um it is what it is it's not something else that's yeah? called uh, that, yeah that's but a phenomenological we, that's a phenomenological reduction in a sense so yeah. You, when so, you, so, so, so Michel Henry is a much, much more strict Husserlian than, say, Jean-Luc Marion or the others. Yeah. yeah. Mario, and, makes, Mario makes Christ the saturated phenomenon, yeah. but he's still in, in the world horizon, as it were. Yeah. Whereas for, Mar, uh, for Henry, you have to encounter Christ, the living word, uh, right. in the, so, in so, the so, from, of the Trinity. Yeah. So, so for Marion, Christ the saturated phenomena culminates in, um, in, in the sacrament and the veneration of the sacrament. 
Yeah. It's very Catholic, yeah. Very Catholic. Whereas that's something we just do not do. Yes, we keep the sacrament for the sick, but we don't venerate the sacrament. The point of the sacrament is that we eat it. Yeah. And we become... And so that we become the body. The body. In the experience of life, tasting and seeing that the Lord is good. Yeah. So in that sense, um, Henri, although, he, again, he's a French Catholic, very traditional French Catholic in that sense, um, and he does in, the, in his book, the words, of, the words of Christ, talk about all of this culminating in, um, in Capernaum with the sacrament which is performed across the centuries. He doesn't emphasize uh, the saturation of a phenomena like Marion does. It's really our participation in it in which we live. Yeah. But so fundamentally, Ma, uh, Henri, but also to some extent, Marion, they accept in a, a post-Cartesian uh, tradition, they accept that God, that God can flood you, as it were, yeah. with his life through Christ and, and put into bracket everything you knew about the world or about yourself. And then you have access to a new life, which is the life yeah. of Christ. Well, Although for, Mary, uh, uh, for, for Henri, it is really that God is already flooding us with his life. The difficulty is that we've turned away from that to be engaged in the world, to be subsumed by the world. Yeah? You know, Mary, uh, Henri points out that it's only because he's already a son that the prodigal can be returned. It's right. not that he becomes a son when he returns. It's because he's a son that he can return. Though he lost so his, his sonship, as it were. He were. lost his sonship, yeah. He, he squandered it living with the pigs and so on. But it's only because he's originally a son that he can return. So he has the only... memory of, of the father. Yeah. I have a more Augustinian reading of that. He yeah. has a memory and he's visited by the, that, that memory. With, then, then he has the power to speak tr truthfully or truly about his own condition. So through... through truthful words, then he articulates a new condition for himself, and that's the, the new condition of a son, of, a, of an obedient son. And yeah. then he returns back home. But that's the desert that he's crosses, that, that he's crossing. And so you're right with your Christological reading of, of Exodus. Yeah, beautiful. This is very beautiful. So, because you've read Kierkegaard, you've read Michel Henry, you've uh, used other philosophers to, uh, to, not to improve, but just to enrich your reading yeah. of the fathers. So in a sense, you're saying that an honest philosopher these days who would just open up the Gospel of John uh, could actually glimpse or understand more about God than uh, someone, who just wants, someone who just wants to participate in the, in the vulgar and very mundane conversations uh, yeah. of, of, of television programs and so on. Yeah. Well, this is wonderful, Father. Now, let's let's if we since we've touched upon the book of of Genesis, we've talked about uh, the Gospel of John. Let's look at the at the most neglected book from the Bible, which almost no Orthodox read uh, uh, believer would ever read, and that's the Revelation. <laughs> what would you tell us about that? Okay, it, yeah. Then this would carry on directly from what we were talking about, John, earlier. Um, it is absolutely clear that everybody in the second century took the book of Revelation to be written by the same John who wrote the gospel. No doubt about it. And that's people like Irenaeus, St. Irenaeus, who was a disciple of St. Polycarp, disciple of St. John, you know, like a grandchild of John, yeah? They're absolutely clear. No doubt about it. It's only in the third century that doubts start to be um, raised about it. And one, you know, the, the two reasons that are given in the third century are that the vocabulary is so different. Right. Yeah. Well, that's not really that true. Yes, the style of writing is so different, but it's got a lot more themes in common with the gospel than any other books in scripture. You know, only in these two books is Christ called the word of God, for instance. Okay. Right. With regard to the grammar, well, it could be that they were written 30 years apart. Okay. And then just look at um, I don't know, the Beatles album that called Help and um, the White Album. You know? or, or Pink Floyd, yeah. yeah. Three or four years different, but apart, but radically different. Okay? Exactly. So that's not overwhelming. The other reason that Dionysius of Alexandria gives is, why is it called an apocalypse when it's the most veiled book in scripture? Yeah? Apocalypse simply means unveiling, yeah? the pulling back the veil. Okay, what we tend to do is we categorize the book of the apocalypse with all sorts of other apocalyptic literature. 
And then we say it's part of apocalyptic literature and we've got to understand it like that and so on. However, you know, um, uh, First Enoch or Second Baruch or other books like that. However, it's radically different in two respects. First of all, um, it's written in the name of the author, in the present. I, John, did this. Yeah. So it's, it's, not, it's not like, you know, projecting it back onto a, a figure from the past, like Enoch or something like that. It's written in the present in his own name. And secondly, it's the only book to call itself an apocalypse. Enoch and the others don't call themselves an apocalypse. So you cannot understand what apocalypse means by appealing to a genre of apocalyptic that we've created. It itself is the apocalypse. So you have to take it as what the word means, and it's an unveiling. So it's okay. a unique so, book. Wait, wait, wait a minute. So if the, gospel, if the apocalypse is an unveiling, then it means that the gospel is a veiling. Okay, so the apocalypse, when you read the apocalypse, you can see the cosmic dimensions of the battle that's being fought between God and evil. Yeah? True. Which, which is veiled in the narrative of the gospel. It's veiled under the narrative of a, of a man's life commenting the cross. Okay, now another way of doing it, uh, Peter Leithart's just done this with a, with a commentary, just came out this past year. He, he argues that the gospel, and it's kind of parallel and, and uh, works complementary to what I was just saying. He argues that the gospel of John and the apocalypse are a two-part work. You know, we tend to read the fourfold gospel followed by Acts. Well, John didn't write his gospel to be followed by Acts. Luke wrote his gospel to be followed by Acts, yeah? yeah. John, John, if you're going to read John, the natural following point is the book of the apocalypse. And he Peter Leithart describes it as being a twofold royal romance. So it starts off, the gospel, the gospel starts off with, the, uh, with a wedding, a wedding feast. But Christ says, my, yeah. Yeah, my But Christ says, my time is not yet. Okay, my hour is not now. Now is not the right time. He's then identified as a bridegroom. The Baptist is a friend of the bridegroom and all that kind of thing. Christ meets various women, all of whom might be the bride, the Samaritan woman, Mary, and so on, but none of them turn out to be the bride. And then he's finally unveiled as the bridegroom on the cross. But where's the bride? It's the yeah. church. It's the church, okay, which is intimated by the blood and water coming from his side and all the other things one could say. Like You've got seven that. churches. <clears throat> but, but now, <clears throat> wait, wait a minute. Um, so it, it culminates with Christ on the cross, um, with, with John, and John's the only one to stand at the foot of the cross. He's the only evangelist to stand at the foot of the cross. Okay? Now the apocalypse opens with John standing at the throne in heaven. Okay? It's the same John, and I would say it's the same place. Yeah? Christ is elevated in glory upon the cross in John. The cross is the throne from which he reigns. So you've got at the end of the gospel, John stands at the foot of the cross, bearing witness to these things, the bridegroom. You've got the apocalypse starting with John standing at the throne in heaven, narrating these things, but in a different register or a different key. And it starts off with the, with the, with the bridegroom, the slain lamb, and it ends with the wedding feast. Very yeah. powerful. So, so the two things are like a parallel mirror into each other. Yeah. And so the whole book of the, of the apocalypse is about the forming of the bride of the bride. The bridegroom is ready. Now the bride's got to be prepared. And the bride is precisely the church, the church whose number is made up by the number of the martyrs. Exactly. But then, so, then you have local churches. Yeah. Who, who, that, that forget about uh, the promise of, of, the, of the bridegroom. Right. And so you've got the seven churches and you've got to be reminded about this, that, and the other, but it culminates finally with the union of God and man in that eschatological marriage feast. That's um, very of the powerful. At the end. So as we have Contra Gentes and De Incarnazione, we have to have the, the Gospel of John and then yeah. the Book of Revelation read together. Not, yeah. not, not set apart. Yeah. Um, I'm, and, and so the book of Revelation is really about the forming of the bride through the martyrs who come to be crowned to fill up the body. Yeah? I'm really beginning to think that the apocalypse is 
really the last work of ecclesiology. Yeah, so we've, we've done all our ecclesiological work by going back to Ignatius and taking his work and then from there onwards, yeah? But Ignatius is part of that apocalyptic tradition. He also writes seven letters, just like John. Yeah. yeah. His vision of the church is a church in liturgy where the heavenly realm of God, Christ, and the apostles is paralleled on earth by the bishop, uh, the deacon, and the presbyters. It's an apocalyptic vision. So I think, but, but which has also some Judaic roots, right? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. But but in order to really get to grips with early ecclesiology, it's not just simply a matter of developing a Eucharistic ecclesiology out of Ignatius. We can say more about Eucharistic ecclesiology if you want to. I, I um, don't. <laughs> <laughs> but 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 it, but it really is. Um, uh, it's set in the apocalyptic context of the Book of Apocalypse. Yeah, and I think because, that we because Ignatius was a disciple, a, a direct disciple of John himself. Yeah, yeah. So and Ignatius it's... was killed in uh, 107, I think, under Trajan uh, yeah. in Rome. And uh, w what happened to John? Excuse me for my ignorance. How did he die? Um, there are various traditions about how he died. Most of them are quite late. Um, you know, thrown into a into a vat of burning oil and so on. You exactly. Know, uh, well, yeah. So still a martyr, you are saying? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Right, 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 right. So the, the, the martyrdom is what gives the early church strength. Yeah. And yes. it's the counter kingdom, as it were. So Christ is not, Christ is not the emperor, is not uh, the political savior. He is the one who gives birth to a new com community, uh, which has a system of values completely different from, yeah. from the world, as it were. Yes, so it's, it's not about preserving traditional culture or preserving, or I don't know, whatever else it might be. It's a radical call to martyrdom. And I would say that that's what's done in monasticism, and that's also what's done in marriage. Yeah? Uh, you know, God says, let us make a human being. In fact, what he does is makes males and females. Yeah, males and females are called to become human. So in Adam, we're male and female. In Christ, we're neither male nor female, but human. Yeah, that erotic attraction between male and female, written in a sense, the erotic attraction is a is a uh, the, the 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 power that's strong enough to overcome the fear of death. I fall in love, and I say, this person's happiness is more important than my own. Marriage is about martyrdom. Love is stronger, stronger than death. That's yeah. the song of songs, right? Yeah, yeah. absolutely. But so, you know, we, we, we can speak for another hour about all of that. <laughs> so, fa so, Father, just to re re recapitulate, you're, what you're suggesting today is that uh, unless you have a Christological reading of, of the Scriptures, that's the Old Testament, you'll still read either merely historical texts or a veil, yeah. which cannot be fully revealed unless you've you've seen, you've met the risen Christ. And, and also you're telling us that uh, there's no way you can understand even the Gospels unless you are part of this matrix, which is, uh, which is the church. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. So to go back to your initial question then about um, uh, no longer being a book culture, but an oral culture, visual, audio, music, whatever else it might be, the church has done that from the beginning. The church hasn't simply presented us with a book and a reading, but a book and a reading which takes place within all sorts of hymnography, visual iconography, ritual practice, and so on, which enfleshes or give, give birth to that um, encounter with Christ in that way. That's why I'm not afraid of, of new technologies, Father, because yeah. if, it, if you come to think of it, it's, it's shocking and it's wonderful that you know people... Uh, living in the United States or Eastern Europe can actually have a conversation about the most important uh, things in life, uh, such as the encounter with the, with, with the living God uh, via, via Zoom or Skype and, mm -hmm. and, and, and spread this uh, word around to people living in Australia or Siberia. And that's quite remarkable. It might be even the fulfillment of a word of, of our Lord that uh, yeah. that the gospel will reach the ends of, 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 the, uh, of, of the earth. Yeah. But like everything, it's two-edged. Yeah. So on the one hand, it could be used that way. On the other hand, and the world is evidence of the fact it's caused more division than anything else. <laughs>
that's so, that's a social media for and another conversation. And all the rest of it. <laughs> yeah, Father, this was a wonderful conversation, and I thank you for that. I, I'm looking forward to seeing your last book translated into Romanian. And if you will be in Romania, do you know anything about your uh, schedule? I hope, to, I hope to come back soon. Yeah, it's been a while since I've been. I hope to come back soon. Yeah. Please drop us a note, and we'd yeah. would love to show you around. Yeah, Please look forward to it very much, Mio. Thank you really so much, and God bless you. Bye-bye. Yeah. Bye.